Today we're going to have a look at the great question of the flat earth. They have often maintained that the sun and the moon are local objects to the surface of the flat earth. Well, in this episode, we're going to give them a chance to prove that. So let's cue up the music and have some fun. Number eight, speaking of the sun and moon being small and close to the earth, what is stopping you from strapping a camera to a weather balloon and sending it up there? Go get up close and personal with either of these objects and take some pictures. <laughs> They're too high up. Okay. So Eratosthenes calculates the, you know, the angle, the shadow and everything based. And so there's the, uh, the path of the sun. So it matches the equator. So the circumference of 40,000 kilometers. So based on that geometry, they came up with a spherical model with the, the radius using pi to calculate then the angles and now i'm going to put in a shameless plug from my friend blue marble science about a year ago he and i did the eratosthenes experiment me from michigan and blue marble science from tennessee now the difference between our locations was approximately 500 miles and we were on roughly the same line of longitude now the day that we did it was in march of 2019 at the spring or the March equinox, which meant that the sun was directly over the equator. So he could do an Eratosthenes experiment from his location, and I could do one from mine. And wouldn't you know it, we found two different suns. And by the way, here is our setup. Blue Marble Science used a 73-inch pole on his back porch, and I used a 7-inch builder's square and a paint stick on the back of my pickup truck. Surprisingly, our results agreed with each other. Now let's go over the numbers real quick. So let's go over these results a little bit. First of all, Observer A was Blue Marble Science and he was down in Tennessee at about 35.5 degrees north latitude. Here was the angle to the sun and the complementary angle, which as you see, agrees very nicely with his latitude and the known distance to the equator. And here are the circumferences of the Earth that we came to. Here's me up at 44.165 north. Notice my sun angle and complementary angle were very close to my latitude. And my distance to the equator and my radius. Notice that these are all within 3% of the true radius of the Earth. But here's the interesting part right here. This is the apparent distance to the sun based on triangulating using these numbers. Blue Marble Science got numbers right around 3,400 miles. 10 degrees north on the spherical Earth, my distance was some 3,000 miles. We have the sun in two very different locations. So when the flat Earth claims that Eratosthenes works on a flat earth, they're correct for one location. If you add two, it only works on a spherical earth with the rays of the sun coming in in parallel. But we can continue. Now, one other thing that he keeps going on about, Eratosthenes did not directly measure the radius of the earth. That was Al Biruni. What Eratosthenes measured was the circumference of the earth. And it wasn't along the sun's path at the equator. It was along the great circle route between the two cities that he used. Then the angles and the distance to the sun. But somehow they got wildly different numbers, okay? So that's a huge problem for the heliocentric model. It wasn't until much later that they decided that the sun was about 93 million miles away and the moon based on the... Um, based on the, the size difference that they calculated 400 times, they placed that at 238,000 miles away. You know, the one thing that absolutely drives me insane about flat earthers is they put these videos out on YouTube and they never bother doing any of their own research or learning about any of these particular experiments. Now, for example, Aristarchus, who was actually before Eratosthenes, 
determine the distance to the sun using a very elegant little bit of mathematics. Let me show you how he did it. Now Aristarchus realized that when the moon was visible during the day, if he held up a ball, it would show the exact same phase as the moon. And he realized that that meant that the rays of the sun striking the earth and striking the moon were coming in parallel. And he used that information to design an experiment to determine the distance from the earth to the sun. Let me show you how he did it. Now, when the moon was half illuminated by the sun, he realized that the rays to the sun and our line of sight from earth formed a right angle here at the moon, 90 degrees. If he could measure at the same time the angle to the setting sun, he could get this angle theta. And using the angle theta, he could describe the distance from the earth to the sun in terms of the distance from the earth to the moon. Now using the equipment that he had, he was able to determine that this angle theta was about 85 and a half degrees. Now based on angle theta, he was able to estimate the distance from the earth to the sun was about 40 times further than the distance from the earth to the moon. And that was obviously quite inaccurate, but it was a logical way to determine that the sun was indeed quite far from the earth. Now, when we do this experiment with modern equipment, we find that the distance from the earth to the sun is about 385 times the distance from the earth to the moon. So he was off by a factor of 10. But considering the equipment he had to deal with, that wasn't all that bad. Now, subsequently, we have been able to determine the distance from the earth to the sun much more accurately. Methods include the transits of Venus and Mercury and direct radar measurements and laser measurements of the distance from the earth to the moon and radar measurements of the distance between the earth and Venus. One of these days, we'll do an episode on how they measured one astronomical unit which is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. It's a fascinating story. It involves a little intrigue. It involves Captain Cook in the South Pacific. And it's just a fascinating story that I'd like to tell someday. 400 times, they placed that at 238,000 miles away and stuck with that by committee, okay? Now, that's not what we're doing when you take a flat, if you assume that it matches our observations of a flat plane. And you do the calculations with the shadow angles, you come up with something like 3,400 miles. Now, Dave, we have strapped uh, cameras to uh, weather balloons and send them up, but they don't go thousands of miles high. They don't. But you know what they do do, Sonny? They get closer than you are on the ground. And as you move closer to an object, according to, wait for it, perspective, that object will increase in angular size. Can you demonstrate that with any high altitude balloon or rocket that you flat earth scientists have sent up? During and immediately after World War II, V-2 rockets were able to reach a height of 185 kilometers. Now that's quite a ways up. And they had cameras on some of the research ones after the war. They showed the curve of the earth very nicely they didn't show a dome, and they didn't show a sun changing in angular size. Can you explain that? And send them up, but they don't go thousands of miles high. They don't. So what are you? What do you? What do you say? If you get crafty with some robotics, which is a stretch given your complete lack of education. I mean, come on, grow up. Indeed, grow up. This information that's on the screen, that's not from my video. That's from yours, Chief. Maybe it might behoove you to read it because it talks about all of this stuff. Are you confused or are you just so obtuse and stuck in your narrative that you can't even look at the information that's on your own video? I tend to go with the latter. The truth of the matter is so opposite. <laughs>
I love you it. You even scoop up a little sample. Maybe the moon is made of cheese after all. Can't you get even halfway there such that the sizes change? You mean almost 2,000 miles with a weather balloon? No, we can't. No, it does not work that way. <laughs> it's just, it's not how it works. Reach for the sky, fellas. Like Professor Dave, I'm pulling for you. Get some flatter scientists out there. Buy yourself a weather balloon. Do a crowdfunding for it. I don't care. But send it up as high as you can get it. Show me that the sun changes its angular size even a little bit. If you go 1 40th of the way up there, the sun should change in angular size. So I'm going to let you contemplate that for a little while and maybe come up with something that will try to answer this question. I'm getting a little discouraged here. You've had eight opportunities to refute Professor Dave. You haven't managed to answer a single question. Everything that you do is a random slideshow which disproves your own position, diversion, deflection, and word salad. You haven't addressed a single problem. Let's see if you can do it with this one because this one should be extraordinarily easy. Next week, we're going to do flight planning in the Southern Hemisphere. This is very straightforward. Very easy to understand. I have high hopes that maybe you can pull off a successful answer with this. But in the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by, and I'll see you again soon. Hey, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button down there. We've got some really cool stuff coming for the channel, and I'd like you to be part of it. So make sure you hit that bell icon and get notified when new videos come out. Take care, guys.